On the show today, I interview Simon Yu, the co-founder of StormX. StormX is a eight-year-old company that has raised $48 million to allow people the ability to get cash back via crypto. They partner with retailers and they incentivize people to purchase through the retailers by offering this cash back. Uh, it's, a, it's a model that has been done before, uh, but they're the largest in the crypto cash back space. So an awesome company. We talked about how they started it, his world of starting a food truck before that, how you start a food truck, what the food truck business looks like and why it's good for tech companies, tech founders to start small businesses. We talked about the growth of StormX. We talked about cashback. We talked about uh, the influence of politics on companies and uh, whether or not there should be a raise in interest rates and inflation and today's current economic climate. Uh, Simon is super smart. He's been doing this a long time and I very much enjoyed talking to him. So hope you do as well. Here's Simon Yu, co-founder of StormX. All right, Simon, we are live. Thanks for sharing your time today. Uh, I, I'd love to learn a little bit more about you, get to know you a little bit more. Um, one thing that stood out to me when I was reading the show notes was the Korean food truck uh, that you started. My wife is half Korean and I have Korean food most days. I love Korean food. What, what do you think when you started that business, what do you think it was in the market that allowed it to take off so quickly? Yeah, no, I mean, um, so yeah, we, we, we talked about this a little bit um, right before this conversation. Um, I, I grew up in Portland and there were a lot of uh, food trucks there. Uh, it wasn't like too prevalent back in Seattle. Uh, this is like around like kind of 2011, like 2014, like that time period. Um, and so I thought it'd be interesting. Um, so I actually started in the beginning because, um, you know, I was a sophomore in college and then uh, I, I had to drop out because my parents had a small business and it didn't do too well. So I ended up working at a job at a bank as a teller and like I got a little bit above minimum wage. So like I, I didn't have money to pay for rent and the student loans that got active. So uh, I, I decided to hustle on the side, uh, took my mom's Korean barbecue recipe and made some like $3 tacos out of it. And then I started just delivering it out of you know, our, my college apartment. And so that's how it started. Um, I, I did eventually go back to school. And then when I graduated, I got a job as a bank as an underwriter, uh, which I hated. But um, on top of that, I was running. Uh, so I, I took that food delivery idea and then decided to launch a food truck in 2014. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, it was uh, definitely a lot of good business experience that I've learned uh, running a food truck. Uh, you, you like, you know, in the beginning, I didn't have a lot of money or with my partner. So we bought a truck that was really faulty. The truck caught on fire a few times in the beginning, like uh, caught oh, on fire shit. twice. Uh, the refrigerator broke down, like pretty much like our water tank just like exploded out of nowhere. And like just, uh, and then in the beginning, like too, just, you know, you have to like push out orders really quickly uh, for lunch, but um, we just didn't have like the speed to be able to do it. So we had to move like like where the vegetables were, where the meat was, where the like, so to make the assembly line more efficient and faster because like you're capped by how many orders that you can have. And so like thinking about like operational efficiency and just, yeah, there's a lot of, lot of very interesting things. And like, it's not like a tech company where like you can afford to not be profitable for a while. Like you have to be profitable, like in order to kind of survive kind of thing. And so it makes you in that mindset. So for us, like, you know, running Storm X for about the past like eight years or so, you know, we've had this kind of mindset. And so it's, this is sort of the reason why we've been able to survive out these like multiple bear markets. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, well, what's know, we are what's an good. average, uh, food, what's an average food truck doing revenue? Like if you see one in Austin or I think of Austin, Portland, yeah. those two big I mean, cities it, I've lived in that have them. It, it, uh, it all depends. Like location is definitely the key. Um, also like they, I think Seattle probably has a, a like higher food costs as well too. Um, so like in Seattle also it rains a lot too. So it's very seasonality, like stuff like that too. So like we would make most of our money in the summer. Like there's a lot of food truck festivals and stuff like that, like bite of Seattle and like all these like music festivals and stuff like that. And we would make a killing there, but in like winter, like we would make almost no, you at all because it would just rain like people don't want to go out and so uh, 
like the first few years we were just doing the food truck model and then we started pivoting more towards like catering for corporations and that's where you know sort of it was more profitable as well too so the food truck became sort of like a marketing engine because we were going around like a lot of the uh high density areas in seattle and then it would catch the eyes of a lot of corporate people that would work there and then they're like hey you know we need this for our office catering and stuff like that and there's so many tech companies in seattle where they often have meetings and like you know they're mm -hmm. willing to pay you know like 17 dollars per person for a meal for catering and then like for a food truck like there's a couple things where like you know you don't you can't predict exactly how much food you're going to need so like you would guess based on we had like this kind of algorithm that we were building like based on the weather based on the location, like how many orders that we try to predict, because if you overestimate or underestimate, you lose money both ways, right? And then there's a lot of prep time, like you have to travel there, the truck could break down while it's traveling, there's all these different risks that you, you run. But um, yeah, going back to the revenue question, like uh, in like a, a good spot for like a two, three hour lunch period, um, you can make like 2,000, like 2,500, uh, like within the Damn. two or three hours for revenue, it's not bad. Yeah. Like, one of the bad spots like I, I can tell you we struggled like you know if we made like three four hundred and um you typically need about like you know about 500 ish to break even and and then the catering but like you know if you have like a 30 40 person order you can have like a 1200 dollars order just from one but we would do like four or five of these to like different companies and so the food waste is also like zero because you know exactly how much to prep there's and uh, it takes like half the like number of employees to actually prepare you just deliver it and you're done there's no after cleaning or all that stuff and then um, also like for price sensitivity wise as well like if you're just selling it to like normal consumers like we're you know our average meal is probably about like 12 13 dollars per person um mm -hmm. but if like if you're selling it to corporate they're they don't really care as much too and then they're you know for their convenience so they're willing to pay like the 17 18 dollars per head and so the margins are also higher for selling, like selling the food. So, uh, and then like food truck festivals are also really fun and painful at the same time too. Cause like you would do these like all day and like you, uh, yeah, we would do like five to 10 K a day. Like it's pretty well. Um, Damn. And then, yeah. And and then, how long where, did you do this? Uh, so like, I think officially we started like being in 2015 after all the prep. And then um, we closed down like when the COVID started. So it's just like, what 2020 of like right. February or March or something. So yeah. what ended up happening is we did pivot a lot to like corporate catering. And then when COVID hit, like everything, all the corporations like shut down their offices and stuff. Right. And then, um, my parents who I had, you know, so eventually I let my parents manage the day to day because I wanted them to be able to, you know, have a good income and all this other stuff. And then I was more hands off while I was operating storm X most of the time. So, uh, I just helped them a little bit with like back end logistics and stuff. But um, yeah, but when COVID hit, I told them, hey, like, we don't know how long this is going to last. You should go to Korea and just kind of rest because they were mm. in their upper like 60s in their age. And then, mm. you know, at that time, like, we didn't know what was going on. So I, and nobody knew. So I, I thought, like, you know, they're sensitive in that age range to get be seriously affected by COVID. And Korea was like, there was like zero COVID at that time. So I told them to go there to be safe side, um, but healthcare is really cheap. So they got like a full like body inspection um, for the healthcare uh, checkup. And then my mom had a tumor in her brain. So uh, and it was really serious where like she needed a brain surgery and all that stuff. So I told them like, all right, this is a good time to just close it. And you know, just you guys should retire and I'll just send you money every month kind of thing. So mm. that's uh, so about, I think, yeah, five or six years is uh, read that, but yeah, definitely a lot of different learning. Uh, you could probably write a book on like how a food truck can help you actually run a business. And, uh, <laughs> uh, or I think it's a pretty awesome background. It, it, yeah, it's it's one of these businesses that most most tech people don't go into, and I think it's an advantage to have an insight as to the real fundamental business operations of like mm -hmm. supply. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be complicated. You know, it doesn't have to be like you have to work at a big company to understand supply chain and yeah. revenue management and risk. It's like sometimes yeah. when you're in this kind of business where you, you, a startup, you often are, there's a level of abstraction from the customer because you're interacting through a screen or you're analyzing data. But uh, yeah, I just give you a lot of uh, credit for going through that. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's, it's definitely a good, good learning experience. I, I do suggest a lot of tech founders to try 
running a smaller scale, like kind of retail business, like hands on first, uh, just because like you, you have to be so laser focused you have to be profitable or else you're like, you're mm-hmm. not going to make it. So no. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so Stormax did, did the emphasis, did the vision with Stormax from the beginning continue throughout the project? Is that effectively, uh, what you set out to do in the beginning is still what you're doing today? Yeah. And so, explain it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So like Calvin and I, um, and I, I sort of experienced my hardship in college as well too. So I had to work like multiple jobs and like do all these side hustles to just kind of support myself, like for basic necessities, like rent and food. Um, and then, you know, Calvin had a very similar, my co-founder had a very similar experience as well too, when he was growing up uh, in college. And so um, we both thought like, like it'd be really interesting there there's nothing that provides like a a single a single place where you can just go and just try to find ways to earn money online like um and so that's where you know calvin originally created this app where you you could watch a short video for like 30 seconds and earn two tenths of a penny in bitcoin uh and it's such a small amount um but the users were growing and so when i started looking at the data i thought okay, there's something here, um, even though it's such a small amount, like I personally would use it, but there's definitely something here. And then we found two things, which was one, um, like regardless of how small the amount of money was, like there was just no place to just be able to earn like as easily like online. And so like, that was one of the big lessons that we learned. And the second was uh, because blockchain was so much cheaper to send abroad than fiat, because if you're trying to send like a hundred dollars to someone in India or China, like it costs you more than that because of wire transfer fees and foreign transaction spreads and all that other stuff. So with crypto, you can send it for, at the time in like 2014, it was like a few cents, which is you know amazing. Um, and so you could be, you could actually be like very global, you know, and just have that distribution everywhere. And so our vision was, all right, let's just keep finding all the different ways that people can earn money online and put it in our app. And so let's just continue building off of it. So we started with videos. Um, we started and then we added like micro tasks where you can do like surveys, you can check out different products and services and earn that way. Um, and then we added the shopping feature in like 2020 and then eventually like three years down the line. Um, I mean, we're, and then, uh, actually within the next few months, we're launching a, a debit card as well too, which are better rewards than traditional cards. And then, uh, in a few years down, um, we'll launch sort of like the Upwork fiber, like a freelance marketplace on top of it as well. So when people just come to our app, like, Hey, you know, I have a few hours, so I want to do like a short task or I have like a few weeks, I'm going to do this like project management tasks and stuff like that and consolidate everything where like, Hey, like we're just here. If you need a few extra bucks just to be able to earn. Uh, and then that's just, it's so powerful because like whether you're a poor college student, like what we were, or you're some, or you're in some emerging country or you just, you have your mom or single mom has like three kids or, or like wherever you are financially, everyone in the world always needs more money. Um, and so like, if we could try to provide even a little bit more of a help, um, that's really what our vision was when we we're trying to build from day one. And then we're still, you know, we still believe in that vision. That's where we're pushing so hard to make mm. that a reality. So. Yeah. It seems, <clears throat> were you influenced by honey? So honey, I know was acquired for 4 billion for effectively a, a Chrome extension, uh, mm. shopping app. Uh, they're acquired mm-hmm. by PayPal. And and I think that was a particularly strong ripple effect in the industry because they weren't very vocal. They weren't, you know, I, I don't recall the founders being uh, like out there. And so it was like, mm-hmm. everyone was like, wow, that's a large company. Did mm-hmm. you see that and say, there's an opportunity to do a similar thing and then pay out in crypto? Or was that? Yeah. So, yeah, so we knew what Honey was. Um, so the cashback side of things are definitely, yeah, it's very similar to Honey or Rakuten, and they're the industry leaders in the space. A um, couple, I mean, you know, we, we create a business because we want to do something that's more efficient or better than what's currently out there, right? So even though Honey was acquired by PayPal for $4 billion, um, one of their big gaps was um, they're using fiat. So US, UK, Canada, and Australia, they're only in four countries. Like we're a much smaller company, mm-hmm. but we're already at 150. And so uh, global distribution is definitely one key advantage. Um, we actually added some um, layers of rewards um, using our tokens as well. So you can get much higher rewards than the traditional cashback provider. And so 
whether it's Honey, like Rakuten or Lolly or whoever, uh, other, there's a lot of players in the cashback space, but they're all offering the same like cashback rate throughout. Um, we, if like, so we, we sort of implemented kind of like an airline pro mileage program with our tokens where the more you use it, um, you can upgrade your tiers and then you can get higher cashback. And so, um, you know, things like that. So if you're more, if you use our app more frequently, you can get like better deals and stuff like that than normal people. And we continue adding more and more stores and more ways to earn, like with the debit card coming out soon as well too, we'll have access to a lot of grocery stores, convenience stores, like all, all gas stations and a lot of things that we're currently missing as well. And yeah, and it just goes back to like, how can we just put, you know, more dollars into just the everyday person's wallet? Like that's, mm. uh, that's our goal, so. And, and is, does the general process, <clears throat> work when you reach out to retailers and say, you know, give them the pitch that this is a uh, cashback built on crypto platform and this will increase. Do they look at, is the primary interest point for customers, for retailers that it increases retention rates and overall lifetime value of a customer. And then they effectively take a 2% <laughs> cost to give that as cashback. Yeah. That, they they do don't really care. Yeah, they don't really care whether we're in crypto or not. It's just we help them drive sales. So like, mm. I really like our business model too because it's a win-win-win. So we help the users earn cash back so the users earn, right? And then we help the businesses drive more sales so we, you know, they win as well too. And then uh, we take a small cut so we're you know we're also making money every time someone earns more cash back. Uh, so uh, like we're not trying to like overly sell anything like that, which I don't like because a lot of like SaaS products or whatever. I mean, if you're, you can make money in so many different ways and run to so many different companies, but I hate it when I'm trying to force myself to selling something. I don't really believe that has value. Like, you know, it's like a $2,000 SaaS product or something like that, or like a gym membership. Like you expect them not to work out. And that's why you're trying to get them or, you know, mm -hmm. sign up. And that's, yeah. Yeah. The, the whole thing's messed up. But in our case, like, I, no, there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't use our app because it's literally free money. And um, yeah, you can think of us as kind of like Costco, like we help, you know, eBay and all these brands just drive a lot of sales. And so they give us wholesale rates and then the wholesale rates, the discounts, um, we're passing that off, uh, to users in the form of crypto cashback. And so, right. it, yeah, everyone really, you know, enjoys it. So for, we're, we're pitching to businesses. It's never like, oh, we're a crypto company. We're trying to do all this. We're like, Hey, like we helped companies X, Y, and Z you know, drive X amount of sales, you know, so you should give us some better rates and we'll do the same thing. And so that's all they care about. So instead of like, mm -hmm. I mean, you've probably heard of like Facebook and Instagram and like their user acquisition channels are not as effective anymore. Um, it's, it's ROI is also very expensive. It's a very crowded space. And so uh, companies are all like trying to find out how to effectively market. But like for us, you know, our pitch is like, hey, just give us a couple of, you know, like percentages that's cheaper and then we'll do all the work, you know, sort of marketing out to the users and help you drive our sales that way. So um, instead of spending marketing, you know, they just, you know, go to the users who end up buying right. stuff anyways, which they, you know, it's, it's a better deal. Yeah. So they, it sounds like they, th the retailers think about it as new customer acquisition, as opposed to just increased retention for existing customers. Are the mm -hmm. retailers generally pretty, um, open playbook with this, you know, do they have a, like a simple, smooth, efficient onboarding, given that there's a few companies in the space where they're like, yeah, sounds good. You know, and they have a, I'm, I'm picturing this would be an ideal sales cycle as opposed to something that's maybe exclusive or are retailers generally like that once they choose a provider for cashback, that's it. Like where, where, are, where is the general attitude of retailers and how difficult is sales cycles? Uh, no, I, uh, most of the ones that we work with are very open. And so, I mean, there's no like company that's just like, I want to do something exclusive. There's no like, e even Honey or Rakuten don't have like the market dominance that they could say like, hey, Costco or whoever, like we only want to do an exclusive deal like through us, like <laughs> their Costco or like, mm -hmm. none of these brands will ever do that because they could just distribute yeah. it to everyone at the same time. And so, um, yeah, uh, but like, uh, so the rates, that all these brands will offer is across it's the same across like all their, all of us or the, the cash got providers where we add more value is through you know the sort of the token economics and like the DeFi stuff that we've implemented that's more um that adds more layers to cashback than it does for a traditional cashback company so um mm -hmm. that's where you know we're able to offer more aggressive rates than some of our competitors yeah 
And, and do you think of the cashback? I, I was interested in what you described a little earlier with the longer term vision. Do you think of cashback as um, a Trojan horse where you get customers in, they're using this app or a Chrome extension, and then you layer on different product lines? Because the concept of competing with Fiverr is a different customer demographic entirely. Mm -hmm. I, I would mm -hmm. imagine uh, maybe a similar one, but but quite a bit di yeah. different in terms of the user experience. Yeah. How, yeah, how do you think about, like, what have you learned in the process of, like, product rollout or just thinking about that in general? Yeah, exactly. So, um, like, Fiverr and Upwork, uh, it's a very different demographic, but it's much, much harder to scale because you need users to be both supply and demand side, right? So you need users to be able to funnel that. So for us, what we're doing is, we already brought in a bunch of businesses. We just need to scale the users. And once we have the users, then, you know, let's say we have like 10 million daily active users, then we can be like, hey, we created this new software. Now you can create this own task and stuff. Then there'll be more tasks that are like, be able to create it from day one rather than us trying to find, you know, both sides of the marketplace, which is much more difficult than a lot of people realize. Um, and like Fiverr and Upwork kind of business model with crypto, like we've explored, like the timing really matters. And right now, the onboarding, offboarding for like wallets and stuff like that is too is still too complicated. Uh, we need it to be like we need a wallet provider that will just be able to just like log on like a username and password, not like this private key and stuff that people lose. And once it's there and then it's connected to your wallet, like then it'll like be easier and it just send it to my username not like zero X, blah, 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 blah. Like, mm -hmm. uh, then like people will use it more than right now. It's just it's still like requires a lot of studying and like research in order to just be able to figure out how to use wallets and stuff, which like the average Joe is still not going to be able to do for the most yeah. part. So it seems yeah. like there, I, I've talked to a few folks who are working on that. Is that something you would build out as part of the platform or is that like an API or some kind of, I imagine you'd build it, but is that right? No, we're no, no we're yeah. not we're not building a wallet. So we're I mean, there's a lot of good companies that are building you know wallet solutions and stuff like that too. And like I said, you, we integrate mm -hmm. API, and so we'll just whichever whoever wins that race will connect with them and help them deliver a lot of users, and you know, vice versa. Will it'll be a, a good relationship? But um, yeah, it's yeah. just timing, right? So we're we're still like if you're connected to the internet, like. I think we're still in the dial-up phase right now. Like everyone's like plugging in their phone lines and it's like super slow and expensive. Um, but then, you know, once DSL and cable come out, then that's when things really start to evolve at an exponential speed. But we're, we're yeah, blockchain, blockchain technology is not quite there yet. And we're, we are slowly getting there, I think. Yeah. How, how do you think about, that? is that the idea of the fiber type platform, is that, way down the road or is that something that you raised money for to build out in the short term or is the the capital raised strictly to grow the existing cashback rewards platform so right now yeah i mean our next big milestone is uh launching the debit card and we're actually launching a checking account as well too Got it. um and then so we're uh making it easier to access to we're still focusing on the consumer shopping side of things just you know, it's very easy just every day mm -hmm. you just buy stuff like normally would and you just get additional cash back. Um, we we want to scale our users to much, much more volume right now than it is. And then once the wall technology is also ready to, then we'll start deploying it. I, I think we're still like two, three years down the line for that part. Um, and yeah, so it, it's just, uh, some of it's dependent on us and some of it's not. Um, so we're just waiting for the right timing to be able to launch that. So, but that, that should be interesting. Yeah. And overall, you know, our, our goal is to just create as many tasks uh, as our tasks or ways that people can just earn. So, and the debit card idea is allow people to receive a debit card, and then as soon as they sign up through Stormx, there would be an account created for them. So they uh, have a. Is do you think of it as the would the banking be integrated right into the Stormx app, or would it be a separate? account like through some other bank yeah so it's it's uh, so it, it'll be available on the stormx app but <laughs> you'll need to sign up separately um mm -hmm. if you sign up a debit card and stuff the kyc process is more strict than just signing up for like a cashback mm -hmm. app so 
um, people need to opt in, but the rewards are, you know, more aggressive and stuff too. And, and um, what we're also building is um, like, it, it's more popular in Asia. It's called super app. So like, if you go to Asia, you know, like grab or like line or cacao and stuff like that, it's like, you can do literally everything in one app. You can do like insurance, you can yeah. do like Uber, you can yeah. do like food delivery, like, like pretty much everything. And so um, we're, we're trying to build that for just a, all the different ways to earn like, yeah, I, 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 this is a really interesting point. Why do you think that hasn't been created yet from even larger companies? Say like, um, you know, a picture yeah. who would have an audience like the Twitter, you know, if Twitter were to integrate payments, if they were to integrate yeah. uh, calls, yeah. like it, it doesn't seem like any network companies or social media companies have that vision. Is that just from lack of good vision or I, cause I hear you when I travel, I've lived in Asia, yeah. lived in Singapore, been to Korea yeah. and these apps are great. Very, very useful. Yeah. Yeah, and then like cacao and stuff like that. Like people are on like like the entire. I, I think it's like forty million of like fifty million people in South Korea, which is huge. It's like eighty percent of the population uses yeah. it. Like forty or sixty percent of their day. It's absolutely crazy. Um, but it's I, I for whatever reason, U.S. is always like five to ten years behind technology. Like and so like really. It, it's just what it is. Yeah. I mean, you've, if you've yeah. lived in Asia, right? So you go to Singapore, yeah. you go to like Korea or Japan or something like that, like technology is just way more, it, like even like the smallest things, like like a toilet or like, you know, just yeah, like yeah, bus yeah. Or transportation or like all these little, little efficient ways. It's just so much more advanced than it is uh, in the U.S. And I think it, a lot of it is because U.S. is so big, it, it does take a lot more time to distribute across. And then also there's a lot of monopolies, like like banks like had dominance for like several hundred years but yeah in europe everybody's using neobanks already and it's so much more convenient you can do everything on your app and you don't need physical branches and stuff like that atm fees are all like waves and but us still doesn't have neobanks really like diver i mean out there and that's why we're trying to go out and launch our card and our checking account and stuff too because we see an opportunity there um but it's just, yeah, it's just the U.S. is always kind of slow for technology. And, you know, I, for me, I, I am fortunate to experience like both both cultures, like both Asian and the U.S. So I can sort of pick like the best of both worlds. I mean, there's definitely cons for both, you know, cultures, but mm. pick the best of both worlds and just combine which, you know, where there's an opportunity in the other one. Do you think there? Do you think it's? Um, do you think culture influences the the preferential, the the preference on product? Like uh, I was watching this interesting video comparing uh, YouTube to uh, I don't know if it's Huawei or no, mm -hmm. it was some 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 app in China that was effectively the competitor to YouTube there. Uh, mm -hmm. And it just had an overwhelming number of features. Like you could chat, mm -hmm. you could pay to chat, you could pay to be mm -hmm. a super chatter, you could like buy merch, you could join the subscription. There's like if I threw fifty ideas at you, just like yeah. you could pay to have discounted transactions, or I mean, th yeah. there was just an almost overwhelming number of yeah. features just sprinkled in, integrated into this yeah. whole experience where like, yeah. and even when it comes to payments, and I think of Spotify, they use yeah. Spotify as an example, big successful company. And mm -hmm. they have like, you go to the pricing page, it's like $14.99 a month. That's it. Very simple, yeah. clean, yeah. nice, but it's also kind of lacks the noisy feature set, which I, yeah. I mean, my intuition is like more features are better, but at a certain mm -hmm. point it's, it's not, and there is beauty and simplicity. Yeah. yeah. Do you think about that? If that, if like, is it an inevitability but, that these platforms are stacked with features or? Yeah. Well, the thing is like from an outsider coming in, it might seem a bit overwhelming, but mm. for these, for the users that use it every day, it's just like they're used to it because they're just seeing like gradual changes. Right. Mm. So for them, it's not as overwhelming. And so like, if you're a local and like, I, I think TikTok is also a, a great example as well too. Cause like TikTok was huge in China already or Asia, like ByteDance and like, uh, and then they brought the concept over to the U S and now it's starting to go viral here. But there's a lot of these like, yeah, technologies that, um, like QR code for payments is like perfect example too. Like U S like I, there was several companies that I've known that had tried implementing like QR payment codes because they saw it in China and try to do it in the U S but nobody would use it. Like they don't even know that you can just go on your camera and then you know scan a QR code, but 
COVID happened and now everybody knows because of the menus and all this other stuff, like every, everybody knows how to do the QR code. So if someone were to launch a like WeChat pay, Alipay kind of like service now, it would probably do very well versus like three years ago, it would probably not do well, you know? Uh, but like, it's a mm-hmm. cultural thing, like in that aspect, because like Asia, they're just used to virtual payments being super fast and convenient. And that that is the downside of like China is like, they don't take credit cards. And then like, yeah. a lot of places don't take cash anymore. And as a foreigner, you can't sign up for a bank account. But I mean, I don't think the US will be as bad where, you know, they'll restrict like, you know, foreigners bank accounts or whatever. But you know, if you really don't need to carry on cash or like credit card or something like that, and just use your phone for like, credit card pay with your QR code. It, it's just super convenient, like on vending machines or wherever. Um, like, and then like, I mean, Asia too, like, you know, we have like the, like the, the door locks and stuff, smart door locks and stuff mm. now like, but that's been around or like the ring door cams and stuff like that's been around since like 1980s, like in the US it only finally started, <laughs> you know, implementing it like five years ago. So. And not everyone's using yeah. it, but literally everybody in Asia, like every house has like electronic keypads. You just enter in a password to go in your house or like, you know, they have the doorbell, you know, camera and stuff like that too. And um, it's just, yeah. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> yeah, dude, I'll, it actually reminds me, I'll, I'll throw out a, a site I liked. I, I haven't checked it in a while, but the site called Springwise was one of my favorite mm-hmm. websites. And they would basically be a user generated blog basically that people can mm-hmm. post innovative ideas that they saw from all around the world. And mm. the idea is like, it would accelerate innovation because if you see this and you're in a country that doesn't have it, well, you could go and start it. There was one, mm-hmm. I think it was actually in Korea where they had mm. a subway system that had wallpaper, like a grocery store, mm. and you could go around and while you're waiting for the subway train, you could basically do your shopping. So you could scan for mm. milk, scan for eggs, yeah. scan for whatever, and then add up your cart, check out, and then yeah. they would get delivered to your house afterwards. And it was like, yeah. That's a great idea. That should just be yeah. in the subways available to people. Yeah. And yeah. It, it's it's not, I don't know why, but the, the yeah. concept of sharing the ideas is really awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, yeah, a lot of people also in the U S too, is like, they don't go out enough to like other cultures and experience things as much. Like mm. I, I, I don't remember the exact statistic, but a lot of Americans have never left the U S like, and that's also, yeah, uh, I think a, yeah. the big, gap as well too so if you go to other countries like europe or asia you tend to see like all right what what are we more efficient at and what are they more efficient at and then you start seeing different perspectives but you need to go out and explore that first too but yeah i think that grocery thing is like it's genius because like you're just you like it's this the subway walls are you know the glass walls are there to protect people anyway and and then they're earning ad revenue and then people feel like they're in a grocery store because they see like bananas, milk or whatever. And then they just go mm-hmm. around just scanning which items. And then by the time you go home, it's there because Asian delivery is, is so efficient. So it's yeah. super convenient, but yeah. Yeah. And there's so many other examples like that. Is uh, Stormex mm-hmm. bigger, like what's the distribution of countries? Is it like 90% US or is it 90% other other company countries? We're, yeah, we're still dominant in U.S. right now. I think probably 30% right now about U.S. Um, but then our, mm. our top five is like all over the world, which is really cool. Like number two is South Korea. Number three is UK. Number four is I think like Netherlands. Number five is like Thailand. So it's like literally all over the world. You know, it's, that's, it's a really awesome feeling. Or like, hey, like all these different countries and different cultures, They at the end of the day, they, they all want one thing, which is to be able to save more money in their pocket. They're like, hey, you're, and it goes back to our vision, like, hey, our thesis is right. So let's just continue adding and more, you know, be more aggressive to just adding it. So, yeah. It, it, do do uh do people find you mostly through the retailers that are on, on the platform, or are they? Do people come in on the crypto side or on the like? I'm a coupon cutter and I'm looking for ways to save money side. Yeah. Uh, I, as of right now, it's been mostly word of mouth. Um, we did do like a couple of like big sponsorships. So I think, you know, you said, mm-hmm. um, you know, you, Portland, uh, we're, we're like the Jersey patch for the Portland Trailblazers. We yeah. Sort of have, um, like branding with uh, World Series of Poker through Poker Go. And so right now there's like World Series of Poker going on for the next few months. And then, um, yeah, I mean, we run online ads and stuff like that too. Uh, we just launched a really cool referral system just like yesterday, which, um, 
you can earn like 10% of all of your referees cash back and also their staking rewards too. So it's a really good way to just, even if you don't use the app, just telling all your friends about it, it just helps you, you know, drive passive rewards back to, you know, your nice. account, which is really awesome as well too. Yeah. And we're just, um, yeah, just trying to find like, once people actually use the app, like the retention rate is really strong. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, like crypto there, it's, it's hard. I mean, there, there's a lot of challenges as a crypto company versus traditional, you know, companies or tech companies in general. But one of the barriers too is like, there's so much crap in crypto, like, you know, all these like meme coins and all these scam coins and stuff like that, where we say, Hey, we're a crypto cashback app. And then, so when they hear, when people hear crypto, they're like, Oh, is that squid game token or something like that? Or some scam that I heard mm. on like Wall Street Journal or something. And then it immediately has like a negative annotation. Um, but then, mm. you know, for us to like, we've built, we have some of these like very strong, like brand identifiers through some of these branding and stuff like that through partnerships. And so, you know, they see Stormx through like an NBA game or like poker or like, um, mm. you know, some, something very credible. Then they're like, oh, okay, this is something I can actually trust. And then, uh, but the trust issue is definitely a big barrier that we have to overcome just because there is so much crap. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I agree with you. I wonder if there's almost an opportunity yeah. to change it from cash back to like, like, uh, like a reverse incentive flow or uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> like. Uh, that sounds sketchier though. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's got to yeah. be some term that that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it can't be confusing. Otherwise, it just yeah. Uh, I mean, cash back. Yeah, like, like, people people seem to understand that model. Yeah, well, and, and that's the thing. I, I think, I don't know why, because still a lot of people like don't use Honey or Rakuten. Like that yeah. whole market too is still very early. So there's a big land grab right now, but it's like people use the coupons, but it's such an old school way of using it. But everyone should, whether it's us or Rakuten or Honey, like everyone should just use it because you just save so much money back. Um, but it, yeah, it's just like, it's not just the crypto in general, but the cashback, model a lot of people are still not familiar with um so that's also the barrier that we have to overcome as well too but um yeah and then sometimes when you know we say like hey it's a crypto cashback you're in free crypto for you know just shopping at everyday sites uh, also some people are like oh it sounds too good to be true and then especially after like luna and celsius imploding um you know i think it probably affects the trust issue again too which is unfortunate but we're like a very traditional model where it's mm -hmm. not like a crazy risk like them, but, um, but still people have that bias, um, just because, you know, they, they hear about it. Have you, have you thought about, that, so. what do you think about the idea? Uh, this is kind of a radical idea, but I think it would help that specific problem. What if you were just radically transparent, like you show, uh, like this is how, this is exactly how many users we have. This is exactly how many transactions per day. Uh, mm -hmm. this is how mm -hmm. much rewards this is, these are all the partners. These are the deals with yeah. the partners. Some of that might be yeah. under NDA, you know, if you have a deal with like, uh, yeah. trailblazers, but is that yeah. interesting? Um, we, we have thought about it, but at, at the same time, like we're so still like an early stage that any kind of edge like that we give away to competitors and it, it just gives them an edge and, you know, we want to survive long enough to and thrive before we get to that point. Um, what would they do? What would like a competitor do if they had all the data that you, oh, they'll, yeah, they'll you just, yeah, I mean, you could use so much of the data, like pickpocket, which vendors or which demographic to target and all this other stuff too. Like you, you'd be able to get such a big edge, you know, like just being, ha having that data available. Um, and for us, like, really? yeah, I mean, we still do want to keep an edge and maintain mm -hmm. that dominance. So, if you if you knew like uh, Honey's numbers or uh, I guess Lolly be a competitor like or anybody, what do you, what do you practically do? Because I've thought about this a lot. Like I've raised money for three mm -hmm. companies, one of which yeah. we were very transparent, and it only helped us. And that's where I question myself to think like why mm -hmm. why not be more transparent about this? Are what what are mm -hmm. other companies generally tend to be very complicated, very kind of long term thinking. And just knowing numbers about it, other companies, even if you had the pitch deck, like it's, yeah. I don't know, it doesn't, I've gone back and forth on yeah. whether there's actual. I mean, Lolly is yeah. much more smaller scale. Like it's, I think they have like 50,000 downloads together. We have like 5 million. So the scale is a little bit different, but for like Honey or Rakuten, mm -hmm. like, yeah, if we were to see, you know, where their user acquisition is like the most effective, like for 
every dollar spent uh, where their demographic is strongest and you know all this stuff like there's a reason like even these multi-billion dollar companies don't reveal that data is because you know, you, you could allow anyone to just be able to replicate the best parts and like it's it's all an experiment that you're running at the end of the day right it's a very mm -hmm. costly experiment and they're probably running like millions or like every month to get that experiment and to figure out which channels work but okay they they spent all the money and the risk but then and this is what a lot of like DeFi problems uh projects also had struggles with too it's like they're the ones that ultimately took all the r d risk and all these like you know risk to build with spending a lot of money like millions of dollars and then someone comes and forks it you know like mm. for force the project and then it's just like copy and paste and then it's just like they do it in like a month's worth of you know burn versus like uniswap took like two three years to build right and then sushi swap built it in like a month you know that's like the perfect example it's a good example like, yeah yeah um so yeah, transparency is also like, I mean, it's, it's great for like the user confidence and all that stuff too, but as a company, it's really tough to just, to be able to continue building when you're the ones taking all the risks and resources and doing all the stuff and you're just throwing it out there for free and let competitors to be able to do that. Well, I so, guess it depends on what yeah. data, like if you're talking about customer demographic data, that would be yeah. different than if it was like total numbers, total traction. Uh, I think there's mm -hmm. more of a culture of people uh, feeling like I can't share this. It's, it's like confidential, but in practical mm -hmm. matters, I don't think if I knew what all my competitors volume were exactly in revenue and customers, yeah. I wouldn't, it wouldn't do anything different. I think it'd be to your point, it'd be more yeah. like, okay, where are they spending their ad dollars? But that's a different level of mm -hmm. disclosure. I think. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but yeah, user data markets like LTV. I mean, you, all this stuff is really important because you, uh, all, all, at the end of the day, it all goes back to cost. All this stuff, mm -hmm. you can run the numbers backwards and figure it out. Um, I, 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 you know, if you play chess or StarCraft or something like that, like strategy games, which I really love. That's why I really love playing poker as well too. But um, like, it, let's say you know exactly what your opponent's going to do. You know, for StarCraft or chess or something like that, you're you're going to pretty much beat them every time. Like it's just. Um, yeah. yeah well, so I, the point with challenge. chess too is like, even with chess, you, you know, everything, you, you have no advantage over the other person for data visibility. Uh, mm -hmm. but I think, I think companies are kind of in the middle, middle ground where it's like they, some companies won't disclose anything like Apple, some clo companies like buffer, which is a, a smaller startup, they'll disclose everything. Mm -hmm. They put on their salaries, mm -hmm. uh, all the company mm -hmm. revenue. I mean, they, they just I mean, literally like extreme transparency. And I think there's a market for some companies to do that, but my hunch is just that as you refer to Celsius and Luna, which effectively kind of draw a black cloud over the crypto market for yeah. most people who are not yeah. deeply familiar with the technology, yeah. uh, I think it's the companies that offer the most transparency. Th optimize for If you optimize for trust, I think transparency and vulnerability <laughs> is the way to get there for projects. I mean, I've yeah. obviously you thought about this a lot more than I have, but it is um, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I do think like companies like Celsius or BlockFi or Luna, like they need to be transparent because they're playing with yeah. money and like people need to know where it's being invested in and what the potential risks are. Uh, totally. I, I think regulation is probably going to catch up and they're going to force these company lending companies to do it, but be able to do that now. But uh, a little too late because billions got wiped off, unfortunately. So yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. It is wild, and that's that's still happening right now. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious about the Trailblazers. Uh, this is a you know NBA team, basketball team. Uh, it's in the city I'm in. What yeah. what is the partnership exactly, and then how did it happen? Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're, we have a five year deal with them. Um, we just finished year one, we're about to get into year two. Uh, like we have the Jersey patch logo and then um, we have like courtside branding for a lot of home games. Um, and then, you know, we have like marketing IP rights and stuff like that too, which is, you know, pretty awesome. Um, yeah, how did it happen? Like, you know, so Honey, so we're, I was originally interested because like we saw Honey and Rack 10 are both uh, in Ibotta. So actually three of our competitors and the, the main means so they're already in NBA team. So like Denver, I think Clippers and, um, the Warriors, uh, and so started doing more research into them and started looking into NBA teams. And then uh, Blazers happened to reach out to us when we were talking to a different team. Um, and then hmm. 
we were talking to several NBA teams about the potential, like the marketing is very effective. Um, and so like we're, when we were talking to the Blazers though, it was very different. Their entire team from like top down, it felt very like real, like kind of like they really want to help us kind of thing versus like some of the other companies. It's just, and like we were actually the first crypto company to be that Jersey Patch partner. So now like there's, you know, crypto.com and all these other companies that are like sponsoring a bunch of sports teams and stuff like that. But we were really early on. And so we actually got a great, you know, a great deal as well too. But um, they were very like, transparent and like you know we want to help you versus the other teams are kind of like we only want your money kind of vibe where mm. like, it was not like it, it didn't feel like it would help us at all they just wanted you know add dollars and stuff like that from us but um we really felt like there was a lot of good synergies um just from their team and so that's why we decided to go with them too um I wish that team had played a little bit better last year, but uh, <laughs> I, mean, this, this year, I think the team will be, you know, so, Lillard's back and the bench is a lot stronger. So, so it's a sponsorship only, uh, you know, you just pay them to have a sponsorship. Is there any cash back yeah. through tickets or that kind of thing? Um, so yeah, we're talking about certain things that we can implement on a daily basis. Um, but yeah, as for right now, it's like a sponsorship kind of thing. Um, but it, yeah, we do get a lot. Uh, it's, it's pretty awesome. And it, it goes back to sort of that credibility thing as well, too. Like, hey, we actually work with the NBA team. It took a lot of due diligence to be able to go mm. through that. Um, you know, so we're not just like some squid game token or yeah. something like that that we're trying to do or whatever. <laughs> yeah. It's a, yeah, it's a product that everybody uses on a daily basis, yeah. Well, well, I'm curious about the um, raise, how you structured it. There's a Storm X token out there now. Uh, was the raise through the token? Was it prior to launching it, or how, how did you go about the different funding rounds? Yeah, we did. Yes, yeah, so, I mean we've been around for like eight years now. Uh, we did several equity rounds before that. Um, when we did launch a token in 2017, you know, we did, um, you know, raise you know, through that as well too. Uh, and then, you know, we had, but the problem with like token raises is like, it's a lot of the VCs and stuff that are supporting you. It's very short term minded. And so when a bear market hits, it's you know all out the door. And that's why I've been super bearish on a lot of these layer one projects that are like mm -hmm. very VC controlled right now too. And then it's just, mm -hmm. they're mercenaries. Um, so we, uh, like, that was like a one-time thing. And then we just like, you know, just kept doing equity deals because the long-term strategic alignment is there because typically equity VCs are there with you for like seven to 10 years, not like one or two. And they're just trying to flip for a quick profit. And so yeah, we're trying to build a more sustainable business. And so, yeah, so far we've raised about, I think close to 48 million so far. And then, you know, we're just constantly grinding away. Um, yeah, we did have a couple of really good years the past few years as well. And so, yeah, we've just been going yeah, that. <laughs> that's great. I, I think there's an advantage to have in, in maintaining a typical corporate structure like C Corp and have shares and equity like a typical company would, but then also building a crypto tool that mm -hmm. allows people to, you know, benefit from, allows the company to benefit mm -hmm. from the exposure to crypto and then you gain access to that market, but you're also mm -hmm. also benefiting from the institutional VC fund and mm -hmm. because that, that also there's a much smaller market, as you know, of, of just crypto investors who want to like invest in the token and take warrants on future raises, investing and all that stuff. Um, yeah. Was it all pretty straightforward or did, is it, did you learn anything unique throughout the process? No, no, it's definitely not straightforward. Um, <laughs> yeah, everything, like everything's a moving target to, mm. um, especially in the U S like it's, there's no clarity at all, which is one of the most frustrating parts because like, you know, IRS is saying it's a property, you know, like FINRA and FinCEN is saying it's a commodity. And then like, you know, the SEC is saying it's security, like, okay, which like, if there's one direction. I think people can just figure it out. Um, I, I think what the U S really needs to do is just start a completely separate entity just for crypto, yeah. not the SEC or FINRA and FinCEN or like whoever just, have like a crypto division and then have the rules very clear and then you'll be able to have the innovators and builders to be able to build you know actual crypto companies without you know potentially violating the law uh which is super gray which is unfortunate and so that's why a lot of companies are built in like singapore or dubai or something like that because their regulations are a lot more clear like that's mm -hmm. it's just 
clarity is like the big thing that the U.S. is missing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Has this has have you uh, turned down ideas internally where you brainstormed something but said, "Hey, it's too risky uh, to yeah. build that now." Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's because like, hey, we don't know where it's going to be. Like, and it's we're always trying to second guess ourselves too, which is like, oh, so you pay lawyers, and the lawyers are trying to like figure it out predict what could happen and like you know the sec's like laws are for example it's retroactive so it, the hard part is you know let's say like u.s decide to ban alcohol tomorrow right and then it's not like starting tomorrow if you don't drink alcohol you're okay it's like okay if the if the sec decides to implement that law and it's seven years back if you have drank alcohol you will you'll get fined or you know you'll get you know whatever charged for it which is like how, how is that possible you know like it's something that you've done in the past when there was no law that was there like no pre like no precedent and then but that's how the current laws are structured which is the lawyers are the ones that make all the money so yeah <laughs> regardless of a bear or bull market the two two sort of uh, entities win lawyers and exchanges uh, <laughs> even, even in a bear market there's a lot of volume right so i mean like all these past swings that we've had like i think some of the exchanges had like a record high in daily volumes um when the whole luna thing mm -hmm. imploded um it's it's wild and um but i mean overall and in, in, but exchanges do in, in the long term like do worse overall and that's why you know you see all like coinbase and gemini and doing layoffs and stuff like that too because there will be a slowdown when people lose that interest but yeah still like yeah lawyers and exchanges make a lot of yeah. money yeah is there any way to automate yeah. that stuff i mean do you think lawyers are just it just takes a, a manual review of each different crypto project um mm -hmm. i've thought about that recently like it, it, yeah you know, i mean there's you, definitely yeah there's definitely um yeah Good firms will streamline a lot of the processes and stuff like that too. And yeah. the bad firms, we've worked with some bad firms too. Well, they're trying to milk every dollar from you. And there's like one particular law firm that's very well known in the crypto industry that has a very rap bad reputation. Uh, they're like one of the largest law firms in like that represent crypto companies. But every crypto company has a bad taste because with that firm because they they. Will, they're they're worse than thieves. They are like they just try to literally take every dollar from you they can. And uh, like what? if you're like first time founder and you don't know that stuff, like it's it'll burn because um, your, your legal expenses are so, like exponentially higher, yeah. higher than what it should be. It's, it's yeah. Other firms to, but, um, well, I won't ask yeah, you and, their name, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> interesting. They're, yeah, they're they're thieves, and there's uh, there's a lot of bad bad actors out there legally bad actors yeah um, yeah well what do you think about the, what do you think about the downturn do you think you're in uh at the uh, uh nfc conference now do you feel like this is i mean not to make predictions about the future but just more commenting on the way things are right now do, do you see do you carry a certain negative positive attitude towards it do you look at it as like oh it's just part of the cycle you guys have been through a number yeah. now having been eight years old uh as a yeah. company yeah, I mean, this is our like third bear market too, and so we're, we're yeah. a little bit better prepared than most companies, I think, are. But um, yeah, well, our app is also kind of like a anti-recession app in a way too, because um, in a bull market, like people might not care about like fifty or hundred dollar mm. cashback rewards every month or something. But now, when there is a recession coming, like people actually do care more than before, and so we are seeing a pretty. Uh, we're we're actually seeing an uptick in users, which is good. Um, I, uh, people that were just in our app for the speculation reason of like crypto, like those guys have left, but then we're seeing a lot more like just normal activity types of users come through and taking benefit of our app, which is really great. And we're just continuing to add more stories. So for us, it's been really beneficial. Um, in terms of like the global macro outlook, like the Fed, you know, they're gonna continue raising rates for like the next two years, that's their current plan. Uh, and then they're also doing, you know, quantitative tightening right now too. and. Um, as long as that happens, like we are definitely going to enter into a recession. Um, my guess is they're probably going to have to, yeah, I mean, it just, yeah. And then uh, talking about the global, uh, macro outlook, you know, the fed is planning to continue to raise interest rates for like the next two years. But as long as that happens, you know, we'll probably enter into a recession, which is not great, but, um, I, I do think they'll reverse their course after a certain amount because they actually don't want to cause a recession. And 
also the presidential election is going to come up, midterm elections and stuff. And President Biden is not going to win if, you know, there, if it's like a full blown recession happens. Uh, and so I, I do think the Fed's going to loosen that up a little bit. Do you think that's a, is that, uh, hopefully a, we don't is that a good thing? I mean, I, I tend to feel like there's so much. I don't know the answer to the in, in, uh, interest rate number, but it just feels like with yeah. the amount of money that was printed, amount of U.S. dollars specifically, mm-hmm. that yeah. uh, to not to not raise interest rates would mean that all that th- that there's just a continual flood of capital, which could have obviously negative externalities from yeah. just you know inflation. Yeah, yeah but uh, U.S printed money it, it was a big ponzi that's starting to fall apart right now right and like but uh, you know, it's just it's already kind of too late that what they, what the government really needs to do is go to their books and figure out where we're spending all this money because there's definitely backdoor deals happening and there's and every government building i've always visited is so inefficient their technology is outdated their processes are outdated you can definitely cut costs by making slight changes and like even like dmv or like some <laughs> government buildings that you know, just upgrade technology, hire, you know, not, not, you don't have to replace the staff, but you could upgrade their um, skill level a little bit too, because uh, just make it more efficient. Um, you could legalize weed and tax all the states that like a higher revenue and all this stuff too. And like, there's, there's a lot of ways that your government can make, you know, nominal mm-hmm. you know, changes that doesn't include just absolutely printing money and destroying or, but the, the problem with the interest rate hikes is like, okay, like food and all this stuff, like it, it's not going to go down. Once a restaurant prints like $15 meals, it's not going to go back down to $10. Mm-hmm. Like gas might go down and some of these other you know, things, but then inflation's here to stay. And the thing is like, are you going to just continue raising interest rates and like to try to reduce that number down, which probably won't go down by that much anyway. Um, but in the risk of blowing up everyone's 401k and stocks and like all oh, their, like, okay, you're trying to reduce the 10% inflation, but you're destroying everyone's net worth by 70% and also having like a huge, you know, if we get into like 10 or 20% unemployment rate and a number of suicides also increase from that as well too. And like, do you risk of doing all of that just to reduce a certain amount of inflation rate? No, I hope the Fed is a little bit smarter than that. Um, because like this isn't like the Paul Volcker like era like we just printed way too much money and this there is no reverse action mm. unfortunately mm. Um, we just have to like from a government level we have to cut costs and like also I think military spending and stuff too is extremely high like if you look at the budget and stuff Insane. we need to scale that down it's like five hundred fifty billion yeah, yeah. Just, yeah and then also like we talk about student loans and all this stuff too I, I had a ton I only had to pay like a year year and a quarter's worth of student loans but because i got you know full ride the rest of the way but it was still like 60k by the time i got out which is ridiculous um but part of it was because i was going to public school and they raised tuition like 10 percent every year you need to create a cap where like at least public schools should not be able to raise tuition for like 10 years yeah. or something like that maybe private schools can but then allow people to choose that because private schools offer more grants and scholarships anyway or, or just um, like the first step on this is like with, with student loans is the government shouldn't give 0% interest loans out to anyone that asks for them. I mean, once you have free money in the system, mm-hmm. everyone's going to take it. And then mm-hmm. you can't blame colleges, but yeah. they just, colleges raise the rates as yeah. fast as there's money out there. So it's like that, yeah. in of its, the fact that that's not like front and center and we're talking about yeah. politicians are talking about forgiving loans, but keeping a 0% loan program is wild. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I, uh, I'm, I'm interested to see uh, you, you kind of said it or alluded to it at least Did the Ponzi scheme of the U S dollars starting to fall apart. And I wonder yeah. how that, yeah, how it goes. I mean, hopefully it's not a yeah, I mean, rock cliff. We're, we're starting to see it blow up, right? Yeah. So, um, U S just, printed all this money out of thin air because it was the reserve currency, but um, it, it, there's consequences when you do that. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not even clear how yeah. great it was to do it in the first place. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, did the money actually go yeah. to people who really needed it and help them through a difficult time in the pandemic? The pandemic, was the pandemic that bad, worthy of it? Yeah. I don't know. Like, imagine, imagine yeah. if we I had mean, a black plague. was not enough. 
Yeah. Yeah. Stim- three stimulus checks and PPP loans is not enough. Like a lot of it went to, you know, banks and actually a lot of it, oh, a bunch of it went to government too, but if government gets all this money, but they're mis- mishandling the funds, that's the problem to begin with. We need to figure out before they get a budget increase, they need to handle, you know, just operations better. Yeah. Like typically like a corporation, if you're not profitable, you fire the CEO, right? <laughs> and then you, you start over and then do you know, restructure. But we don't, we're not holding anyone accountable. We're just constantly just yeah. whenever there's a debt ceiling that, you know, that hits every few months, we just raise it. And like, no, like, dude, it's nuts. I, I think people are, someone home. I think inflation is the, is the kind of thing that uh, draws everyone into a, almost a, a requirement of understanding basic economics where you could previously just not even think about it at all. You're now, everyone is now being, um, you know, I think crypto had this effect too, where you hear the sophistication and interest that people have of like economic and monetary theories and in practice implementation and futures and dividends and shorts and all these things that most people wouldn't have thought mm-hmm. of unless you're on wall street. I think the same thing mm-hmm. by, you know, a counter example is, Inflation allows really requires people to figure out where, how the system works and put pressure on political leaders to be financially responsible. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, man, I'm with yeah. you. It doesn't look great for Biden, but good. I mean, we need we need to. That's such a requirement of a of a leader. Yeah, yeah we need pressure. Like yeah, you said. yeah. So I, I think the pressure is on now. I mean, yeah, I mean, President Biden right now in terms of. His outlook. It looks bad because you know he said he was going to cancel student loans and he didn't. So a lot of the lower middle class people are pissed off. Inflation's hitting everyone, so everyone's pissed off because of that. And then uh, corporate taxes are at, like all time high, so the wealthy people are also pissed off. So like, everyone's <laughs> pissed off right now. So uh, they gotta, yeah, they got to do something to revert the course. Yeah, and, you know, make everyone rich again. Yeah, you know, or else uh, he's definitely going to win. Yeah, so, we, we shall see. I mean, that's what I'm hoping for at least. Totally. Yeah. Well, I love what you're working on, man. Um, Simon, are you active on Twitter or anywhere else you want to throw up personally? Yeah, I'm pretty active on Twitter. Uh, it's like the only social thing I use. I'm uh, Simon Y-U-S-E-A, so Simon U-C, so you can follow me there. Um, yeah, my, my personal tweets uh, don't reflect the company. So good, good, good. <laughs> to talk about yeah, yeah, I like that. I like when I like when I like when founders are just uh, authentically themselves and not trying to like just push the company yeah. all the time. But hey, man, I know you have to run. I really enjoyed yeah. meeting you and getting to know you, what you're working on in the background. Yeah. And uh, yeah, best of luck. Keep crushing it, man. Have fun at the conference. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. See ya.